Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. Don alcoholic. Cameron, thank you for that and for all your wonderful hosting duties. And uh, he was handing out silverware at the banquet. I'm like, what aren't you doing? He had that look like, I'm doing everything. And, uh, <laughs> and I'll tell you, that's one way to stay sober, man, and it works real well. Uh, I don't know about the rest of you, but if you've been here for the entire day, haven't missed a session, you're, you're not just sober. You're like super sober. You know what I mean? I'm just... I am so sober right now, and uh, I don't know if I've ever been this sober. I have so much to work on, and uh, but thank you so much for opening my mind. All the other speakers that have just done a wonderful job carrying the message to all of us, just outstanding. What a wonderful, wonderful time we're having at State Line, you know, being returned to the wild, so to speak, and we're all back in person again. And uh, I'm always curious in a room like this, just out of curiosity, do we have any new friends in their first year of sobriety? Anyone in their first year? Raise your hand. Get it up there. Oh, that's great. What about your first three months? Anybody in the first three months, first 90 days? Oh, right there, there, there. Oh. That's remarkable. You wouldn't have caught me in this room in 90 days. I'm telling you what. New, no, new. No, the clubhouse was too terrifying for me. Congratulations on being here. And if nobody's done this yet, let me be the first, and I'm sure it's been done for you. I want to cordially welcome you. If you're in your first 30, 60, 90 days to Alcoholics Anonymous, that's what they did to me. They did it in a lot of different ways. They did it in their kindness. They did it with their love. They did it with their inclusivity. They did it with the way that they made sure there was a place for me at the table of Alcoholics Anonymous and everything. And that was from day one. So I want you to know you're cordially welcome. And I know it's tough to be new at Alcoholics Anonymous. It's tough to be the new person surrounded by people that have experienced the gift of transformation. Because we're annoying. (laughs) We're happy. And we like to talk about how happy we are. And it can be very repellent. And and we say things to new people. Listen, we're, we're trying to encourage you. We're trying to give you some hope. That's what they did for us. And we forget that sometimes these things aren't encouraging. They're infuriating. And we say things to new people like, I've been right where you've been, kid. And I remember when they said that to me, and I'm sitting at the low point of my existence, 31 years old, more dead than alive, living at my sister's house, no car, hopelessly in debt, warrants for my arrest in two counties. You've been right where I've been. You know what I mean? You've got socks that match and a valid driver's license. Please. (laughs) And I would think to myself, no, you haven't. You don't know me. You haven't been where I've been and done what I've done. But let me tell you, if you're new, in your first 30 or 60, 90 days, we know a lot about you. And you're thinking, how could that be? You haven't even met me. You haven't even heard. Trust me. We know a lot about you. For instance, this hasn't been a good year. <laughs> Wasn't a good year for us when we got the Alcoholics Anonymous. Nobody gets here on a winning streak. You know what I mean? And But we are so excited you're here. And that's because we know AA works. And we know the big secret of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's the truth, and it always will be the truth, and one of the most important things about AA, that it doesn't work because of the alcoholic, it works in spite of the alcoholic, in spite of what I bring to the game of recovery, the raw material, this belly full of fear, deep resentment, old ideas, pitiful and comprehensible demoralization, all these things that are conspiring to kill me, what we find in Alcoholics Anonymous, the power that all other speakers have done such a wonderful job describing this power cuts through all of that. And it's the only thing I've ever found in my life that's worked. And what I'm tasked with tonight is to talk, you know, quickly in a general way about principles before personalities. And, uh, you know, the first thing I had to understand is I didn't think I had any principles when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. My sponsor laughed and he said, oh, no, you have tons of principles. It's the principles you've chosen to live by that are causing you all the problem. 
And if you look up principle in the dictionary, my favorite, my favorite definition is law of conduct, which means how you're going to act, Don. How you're going to act. So we have to think about how I acted before Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and I'm wearing milk bone underwear. Get the other guy before he gets yours. You know, it's all about me. It's a selfish, self-centered approach to life. And I walk into a place in Alcoholics Anonymous where they talk about things like service, and they talk about things. And the other thing is I'm driven by that propulsion system of untreated alcoholism. I'm driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-seeking, self-delusion, and self-pity. And I'm filled with self-delusion. And that delusion is a false psychotic belief. A self-delusion is something that I believe that's true about myself that just ain't true. And here's the biggest one. I'm a wonderful human being. Just ask me. <laughs> Except I drink too much. I'm quick to admit I'm a liar, a cheat, and a thief under the influence, but let's admit, those things are impossible once I'm sober. So it's easy for me to identify whiskey as the culprit. So I blame everything that I've done before Alcoholics Anonymous on the fact that I drink too much. Until sober and Alcoholics Anonymous, I continue to lie, cheat, and steal. And here's my favorite story about that. My sponsor got me a job when I was about 30 days sober. And that's when the traditions really started showing up in my life. And I didn't know that the traditions were showing up in my life. He didn't announce the traditions were showing up in my life. He didn't take me to a book study. What he did at 30 days sober where I was going to AA every night and collecting unemployment from the state of California. And I found out what an AA bum was because I heard two members talking about a guy, and they said, that guy is an AA bum. And I went to my sponsor, and I said, what's an AA bum? He goes, ah, that's a guy that ain't got no job, but goes to a lot of meetings and sounds real spiritual. And I go, that's what I want to be. That sounds great. <laughs> so my first 30 days in Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm not working. I'm collecting unemployment. My sponsor isn't talking to me about any of that. And I'm having a very good time in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I'm crazy. I want to hurt everybody and everything. But I'm not drinking, and it's catching my attention. And you're being kind to me and loving to me and inclusive to me. And I'm enjoying that experience. And then I got 30 days and it was like everything changed with my sponsor. You ever have that experience where you think you know them, you think you got them figured out, and then suddenly they throw something, they throw a wrench in the works, and you're thinking, what did I do to piss you off? And he came up to me and he said, any particular reason you're not working other than sheer laziness? And I said, No. And he said, we're self-supporting through our own contributions. I had never heard of that before. It was a novel idea. And not only did he think it was so important I got, he got me a job. And he got me a job as a laborer on a framing crew where I was working with my hands for the first time in my life for minimum wage with taxes taken out, where I had a nickname on the job site, The Bleeder. So now I go to AA all night, I bleed all day, and I don't want to be working, I don't want to be sober, and I'm wondering what I did, and I don't think I like these traditions very much. And he would always bring the traditions up based on what I was doing at the time. He would tell me what I had to consider. I got sober in an Alano club. They had a very nice glass display case with lots of drunk junk in it. And they had a, just a wonderful selection of bumper stickers. And I remember being new and looking at the bumper stickers because I'm trying to figure out which bumper sticker I'm going to buy. He goes, well, what are you doing? I go, I'm picking out my bumper sticker because I thought that's what you did in AA. I mean, I thought you got a bumper. You got sober and you got a bumper sticker, right? And he says, well, first of all, you don't have a car. And he said, and when and if you do get a car, I have a sneaking suspicion you're not a good driver. And we really don't want you out on the road representing Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> and my sponsor told me that he believed putting a bumper sticker for AA on your bumper was a violation of the 11th tradition. He thought it was a violation of anonymity at the level of press. And I'll tell you what, it sounds funny, it sounds a little rigid, it sounds a little over the top. There have been times in my 30 years of sobriety with my sobriety date of September 16, 1991, where I am damn glad I didn't have a bumper sticker on my, on my car representing all you good people. Because I am imperfect behind the wheel occasionally. Occasionally. 
I knew an Alcoholics Anonymous. And the thing about this is we're not, when we talk about principles and we talk about this law of conduct, we're not just talking about the traditions. We're talking about the steps. We're talking about the concepts. We're talking about 36 facets that are applied to our life in and out of the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I think that's important to note. You know, in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it refers to our program of recovery in three places as a design for living. You see, this isn't something I just do between gavel to gavel or just do when I'm with you people. I'm supposed to take these principles. And I'm supposed to take them in the business. I'm supposed to take them into my home. I'm supposed to take them into my heart. I'm supposed to take them out in the road. And the problem is, I don't know how to do that. And I'm new in Alcoholics Anonymous, convinced I'm a wonderful human being. Convinced, yes, I'm a liar, a cheat, and a thief, but I could never do that stuff sober, and I'm back to work. And I remember getting up. I was getting up in the morning, about 4.30 in the morning. I'd have to walk about 40 minutes to where I got picked up by this guy who was kind enough to pick me up on the way to the job site. I'd go bleed all day, and then I'd come home. And I didn't have any money, man. I'm not making any money, so i got to make my lunch every day or I go hungry. But I'm, un- I'm undisciplined. I'm an undisciplined alcoholic. And one morning I get up, man, and I'm running late because I slept in. There's no time to make my lunch. And I'm going through the laundry room of my sister's house where I'm getting sober. I'm going to cut through the garage and out the man door like I always do. And as I go through the laundry room, there's her purse sitting on the laundry, on the washing machine. And I remember thinking, why does she do that? Why does she tempt me? (laughs) And I don't know, maybe because she thought I was sober and Alcoholics Anonymous and her money was safe. Foolish woman. (laughs) And I remember thinking, don't do it. Don't even look. But, you know, I just, I'm just going to look. I look at her wall, and there's all this cash. You know, and I got the devil and the angel on my shoulder. Don't do it. You know, I'm in AA. I can see my sponsor's face, but I took 20 bucks. And I felt terrible, but I spent it. You know what I mean? I had a couple of bucks even made it in the seventh tradition basket, right? So it's not all bad. And I'll tell you, it was a long time before my next payday. That's what it felt like. That was the longest four days of my life. And the first thing I did when I got that paycheck and cashed it is when she wasn't looking, I snuck 20 bucks back in that wallet. And I thought, that was awful. I really learned a lesson. I'm never going to do that again. And I didn't. Not any more than six or seven times. (laughs) And I went to do it one morning, and I just couldn't do it. And I don't know if I'd been to enough meetings. I don't know that if your kindness had gotten through to me. I don't know that, you know, by that time I had probably worked the first three steps. I don't know if maybe God had entered my life on a level enough that I started to be accountable to something other than myself. I don't know what happened. I just know that that morning I decided I'd rather be hungry than steal. And that might not sound like something to you, but it's a big deal to me. Of course, you got to fast forward months later, and I'm making formal amends, and i got to sit down with my sister and tell her all the stuff that I did that she already knows. And I get to the end of, my, of telling her all the things that I need to make amends for and all the harms I've done, and I go, listen, there's something i got to talk to you about I don't think you know. And she goes, what would that be? And I go, I stole from you. She laughs. She goes, oh, Donald, you've been stealing from me forever. And I go, no, you don't know about this one. This was sober and Alcoholics Anonymous. She goes, what are you talking about? I go, well, sometimes I'd go to work and I didn't have money for food. I hadn't made my lunch and I was still 20 bucks from you. And on payday, I'd slide that 20 bucks in and I don't know, I must have done it six or seven times and I don't know how to make that right. I don't know how to explain that. I have no viable excuse. You've been so good to me. And I know she's going to put me on blast. I know she's going to light me up and this is what she says. Oh, thank God you're telling me. I thought I was losing my mind. I go in my purse, I got 60 bucks. No, I got 40 bucks. I go in my purse, I got 30 bucks. No, I got 50 bucks. I thought I was going crazy. (laughs) Thank you so much for telling me. Just trying to be of service. We don't have time to do a traditions workshop. I spend a lot of time talking about the traditions. Nor do I think it would be a good idea because I'm the pre-comedy show talk after the fill your belly guy, so (laughs) most of our oxygen and blood is below our waist at this point. But there are some things I'm going to want to talk about. I'm going to want to talk about unity. I'm going to want to talk about membership. I want to talk about group conscience. I want to talk about controversy. And I want to talk about anonymity. 
And I think these things are universal to our society. All the traditions are important. I just don't have time to talk about everything the way I'd like to. But I want to talk about unity. I want to tell you why unity is so important to me. You see, unity saved my life. There's no other way to describe what happened. 1985, I'm drunk in Boston. I'm hiding under a porch because I tore a house party apart. I got chased through backyards by the police, and I can hear their voices. And I got my back turned to the opening, like, if I can't see you, you can't see me. And I'm terrified like a little kid that saw a horror movie. And I remember thinking, how did I get here? 1987, I'm in a head-on collision. I almost lose my life, and I almost kill another person. I'm in the ER, and they're stitching up my head, and I'm wondering, how did I get here? And what I know today is when both those events happened in my life, at that very moment, somebody was setting up an AA meeting. Somebody was making coffee. Somebody was putting out books. Somebody was counting the money making sure the Treasury report was accurate. Somebody was answering the phones at the central office. Somebody was putting money in the birthday fund envelope and mailed it off to GSO because they believed in the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. That was happening for 87 years before today, and it was happening for a long time, 57 years before I had my opportunity to get sober. 57 years of people waiting for me. They were waiting for you, too. When we talk about unity, we immediately jump to our home group. We immediately jump to our knit, our sponsorship family, our groups that we attend. But that's not the unity I'm talking about. I'm talking about the unity of the Society of Alcoholics Anonymous, which includes all alcoholics, known members and members yet to be. Many of our efforts that we do, we do on behalf of people we haven't met yet. Because we know that alcoholism is alive and well out there in the streets, and we know they are coming to Alcoholics Anonymous, we just don't know when. And we must be on the ready. And I think about people I've never met, our people I've known. What an honor and privilege to share a stage with a picture of one of my heroes, Clancy I who taught me so much about unity and the value of unity in the home group setting, a man who changed my life, a man who put enthusiasm in my heart and my soul, a man who put wind in my sails, and a man that when I met at two years sober with already the great, great love of Alcoholics Anonymous showed me how possible it was to fall even deeper in love with something and how to show it respect and how to give it the attention it deserved. What an example, and what a great man, and I will always be grateful for what he showed me. But as we were getting ready to come to Alcoholics Anonymous, as each and every one of us was finishing our stories, putting that last line on that essay of destruction, as we were finishing up, they were in the rooms waiting for us. True unity. We do so much on behalf of people that aren't here yet. But do we have that mindset in our day-to-day -day AA lives? Do I? How did I learn about unity? At the low point of my existence, when my family wanted to throw me out, when I said I'll go to AA and everything and they didn't believe me, I had to call Alcoholics Anonymous. And a man who was a member of a home group who believed in answering phones at central office took my call. I hadn't been to sleep in days. It took him 20 minutes to walk me through the directions from the front door of my sister's house to the front door of the Simi Valley Alano Club. Now, I want to be clear. I'll tell you what the, how to get there. Leave the driveway. Make a left. Make a right at the first corner. Go 3.5 miles. Look to your left. There'll be a strip mall. You'll see a circle and triangle. Turn in. 20 minutes for me to get that down on paper. I, I, don't, I, I can't follow what you're saying. Could you say that again? 
take a breath, kid. It's going to be okay. He walked me through for 20 minutes. I didn't meet that man until I was six months sober. When I told him what he had done for me, he shrugged it off. He goes, that's just what we do in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm glad you're sober, kid. It was just another day at the office for him. He was just trying to pass on what had been so freely given to him. I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous and I found coffee on the ready, big books on the table, and men and women that had a plan in action for the still suffering alcoholic. They didn't have to huddle in the corner and go, we got a new one, what do we do? You see, there was a real home group in session that night. And there were men with their eyes trained on the door and trained on the room looking for men to 12-step, and they 12-stepped me. And I didn't understand that what I was really seeing was unity. I didn't see the hundred business meetings they went to where they were honoring their primary purpose to carry the message to the alcoholic that still suffers. I didn't understand that everything that they did as a group was to perpetuate that one job in Alcoholics Anonymous, that everything else is activity. And all that activity should go to promote the primary purpose. I didn't know that. How could I have known that? I'm dying from alcoholism, and that's the beauty of it. They knew it. And I start experiencing unity. I love it in the big book when it describes God in this fashion. We believe the realm of the Spirit is broad, roomy, and inclusive. Never exclusive or forbidding. We believe it's open to all men. Isn't that a wonderful way to talk about our third tradition? I think about what I was like when I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous. Filthy, hair down the middle of my back, full beard with food stuck in it, violent in nature, on a 10-year losing streak. And you couldn't have been more delighted to see me. I was the kind of guy that when I walked down the street, if you were on the same side of the street as me and you had your children, you pulled your children closer to you or you crossed the street. Yet I walk into Alcoholics Anonymous and you acted like you've been waiting for me your entire life. True unity is that you were waiting for me. And so I start experiencing unity my first night in Alcoholics Anonymous. Not that I understand what I'm experiencing, because I can't see what I can't see, and I don't know what I don't know. I don't know the effort, the hundred business meetings that these people had attended, all the 12-step work they had done, all the step work they had done in their own personal life, the resurrection, transformation in their life, where they had their hearts and their minds attuned to the welfare of others. But I was soon introduced to it. And the instrument of introduction to this way of life for me was strong sponsorship. I can never diminish the impact of sponsorship in my life because I don't know anything. And to have a man who was an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous start to make suggestions and start to lead by example using the ancient spiritual principle of the invitation, never dictating. You know, true Alcoholics Anonymous sponsorship is I can't ask anybody to do something that I'm not doing. And so he would never ask me to do something that he currently wasn't doing. So when he asked me to do panel work, when he asked me to go into hospitals, when he asked me to go into detox, when he asked me to go into treatment centers, when he asked me to set up meetings, to make coffee, to do committee work, all these things that he asked me to do to ensure my own sobriety, he was currently doing them. And there's something about shoulder to shoulder that's attractive, isn't it? And isn't that what it says in the chapter, Working with Others, we commence this common journey with the new man shoulder to shoulder. Not ahead of him, not behind him. Shoulder to shoulder. I had a sponsor who had dazzling recovery. Yes, he used to just say, Don, I'm just a drunk that hasn't had a drink today. I'm just trying to stay sober. I'm taking the actions dictated in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I like what I'm getting. I suggest you try these actions. And he makes it attractive. But I've got problems. I come to Alcoholics Anonymous and I don't like anybody that's doing better than me. And everyone's doing better than me. I'm your typical alcoholic. You drag me in on a meat hook and two weeks later I'm bitching about the coffee. You know what I mean? I am slowly building resentments 
against everybody in Alcoholics Anonymous. And you're not doing anything wrong. You're just having a good life. And it really pisses me off, i got to tell you. <laughs> and then occasionally one of you would do something that you thought was helpful that, you know, just was dangerous, to be honest with you. Because it was all I could do to listen to one person in Alcoholics Anonymous. And some people don't understand that. And they think because they have time or because they're in the room with you that it gives them the right to give you that unsolicited advice. Well, I don't know you. That might be a problem. And I can't tell you how many times somebody said to my sponsor, can you do something about your gorilla? He's threatening people again. You know, and I just... And I remember I'm at the meeting this one night, and this guy named Smitty, and I hated Smitty because of what he was about to do. I'm sharing in a meeting, and I mispronounced the word altruistic. And Smitty got called on to share after me. And he shared very nicely. At the end of his share, he goes, and by the way, Don, it's pronounced altruistic. Oh, he made the death list. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and I just looked at him, and I said, the first chance I get. You know what I mean? You fast forward about two weeks. And we're at the end of an evening of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's about 10.30 at night. Sponsor rolls up on me and goes, Hey, man, before I drop you off, we're going to swing by Smitty's. He needs help moving a couch. <laughs> and I said, Smitty's a jerk. And he goes, Yeah, he is. Uh, but we're going to move his couch. And Because uh, Smitty was a member of our home group. And I found out that night that you can do service for somebody you don't like. <laughs> but that's not the gift. The gift is I walked in to move this couch, and I'm telling you, I didn't need anybody on the other end. I am pissed off, man. I'm swinging that couch around, you know, and <laughs> and I move the couch to where Smitty wants it moved, and I can't, I'm not even making eye contact with him. I just hate him, you know, and the, and Smitty gets between me and the door was I, when I go to leave, and he puts his hand gently on my chest. He goes, hey, kid, I want to say thank you. I'm not as young as I used to be, and I couldn't have done this without you, and I want to tell you I really appreciate it. And then he gave me one of them big AA hugs, you know, where they press up against you way too long. And uh, and I'm all rigid, and I'm thinking, oh, no. Now I can't kill him. Yeah. But I walked out that night, and I didn't hate Smitty anymore. My home group from two years sober to 13 years sober was the Pacific group in West Los Angeles. They had a little trick if you had a resentment against another member in that home group. If you went up to your sponsor and you said, hey, you know, so-and-so, yeah, I hate that guy. I'd go, good, this is what you do. Uh, get to the meeting early and find him. Make sure you shake his hand, look him in the eye, ask him how he's doing, and then wait for him to tell you. And if you can, at any, if it's at all possible, try to sit next to him. And you'd go, what? And there's a principle here that's implied by the actions we learn to take, which is love and hate can't exist in the same space. You see, I can't serve you and hate you at the same time. And I know this. When I serve you, I love you. And I like the way I feel when I love people. Don't you? And I don't like the way I feel when I hate people. Do you? But I got it backwards because I got these old ideas. These old ideas tell me that you're getting over on me. These old ideas tell me that you're taking advantage of me. But I'm young and Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm going to meetings every night. And, you know, it's interesting. We've, we've had some talk about meetings. And we've had some talk about, you know, be careful with this stuff where people say meeting makers make it. And it almost sounds like you're trying to bag on meetings. And i got to tell you, here's my experience. Meetings kept me sober until I could work the steps. You know why? I went to good meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous where there was true unity and respect for the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. So I went to meetings where people actually talked about the solution. I went to meetings where people actually talked about alcoholism. You see, I'm the kind of guy that I'm going to make it through my day. And my head's going to chew on me all day because it started first thing in the morning when I'm new, right? I get up, my head's in the corner doing push-ups. Oh, you're good. Great. Let, you're up. Let's talk. You're a loser, Don. <laughs> you're not going to stay sober. Who are you kidding? You never stay sober. You're going to drink again. I know it. They know it. Everybody knows it. We're just waiting. And I say good morning to my head. Good morning. And I just go off to work. 
and I bleed all day, and I hate my job, and I hate my boss, and I talk to my sponsor about the boss I hate, and he goes, if you kill him, I won't sponsor you, so I can't kill my boss. And I just think, if I can get to the meaning, if I can get to the meaning, if I can get to the meaning, I'll be okay. And I ran to Alcoholics Anonymous at night. And thank God the people there understood what it was like to be new and recovering from alcoholism because men would share in an honest, open manner about what it was like to coexist with alcoholism and the tools they were using to get through their day. They would talk about prayer and meditation. They would talk about calling their sponsor. They would talk about being of service to their common man. They would talk about going to work and being of service and turning their work life into a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. They talked about these principles that they were taking from AA and applying them in every area of their life. And they gave me solution after solution after solution. Sitting in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, I soaked it up like a sponge. You were telling me how to live with this. You see, the main problem of the alcoholic resides mainly in his mind. You're going to have to give me something else because what my mind produces is not helpful. What my mind produces leads me to a drink. But what you give me to pack into my head when I attend your good meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous gives me something to temper those thoughts with. And so I'm learning about unity. I'm learning about how it's so important that I understand I'm no more or less than you. It doesn't matter about bank account education, sexual orientation, length of sobriety. I'm no better or worse than you. We are in Alcoholics Anonymous together. We are in the same tribe. We're in the same family. And that allows me to be included. This spirit, this principle of inclusivity, which is so important. And unity keeps showing up in my life. And at two years sober, I go to the Pacific Group and I become a member there. And I see unity on a level I didn't know exists. I remember thinking to myself, Lines from the big book popped into my head. There you'll meet lifelong friends and commence your common journey shoulder to shoulder. I go, my God, it's the people in the big book. Because I had heard that 10% of the people in AA did 90% of the work, and now I'm in a group where 90% of the people do 100% of the work. I'm in a place where being active is the rule, not the exception. I watch people move as a group. I watch old-timers doing as much work as newcomers. You never heard an old timer in that group say, well, I don't, I let the new people do it. I don't want to deprive them of the experience. We just had a lot of commitments. And I start getting examples on how to live out in the world by being active and of service in Alcoholics Anonymous. I remember being four years sober and I got elected uh, head of commitments at the Saturday Night Way of Life group. 450 people every Saturday night, 275 commitments. How in the world do you need 275 people? Well, you don't. But if you believe that having a commitment is part of being a home group member, if you believe that what it actually is is a tether, something that ties you to the group, gives you self-esteem and a sense of belonging, a sense of home, you'll create commitments. And there were goofy commitments. One guy had a commitment to bring a bottle of water up for the speaker. And another guy had a commitment to take it away after the meeting, right? (laughs) You should have seen cleanup. It was in the Santa Monica Junior High School uh, cafeteria. And it was like a military operation because first the crew would come in, they'd clear all the chairs away. In three minutes, all the chairs, 450 chairs are stacked out of the way. And then like this parade of sweepers come through. Sweep, 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 sweep. And then the moppers, moppers, the moppers come through. And it's everybody's joyous and everybody's show. It's the only place in AA I've ever seen a fist fight over a mop commitment. <laughs> Two new guys. It's my mop, you son of a bitch. Give it to your your back. Because they made service attractive. And is it about pushing a broom or pushing a mop? Of course not. Do you need 275 commitments to the 400? Of course not. You know, it's about common bonding experiences. You know who my best friends became? Guys I did mopping commitments with. Guys they did sweeping commitments with. Lifelong friends. I think about how we met young dogs in Alcoholics Anonymous. And as our lives grew, as we fell in love, as we got married, as we started families and careers, we commenced that journey shoulder to shoulder. But it all began doing service in Alcoholics Anonymous and becoming bonded together in recovery, in unity. 
I remember uh, I met my beautiful wife Eileen in Alcoholics Anonymous, and we've, you know, I fell head over heels in love for Eileen like he threw me out of a boat with cement shoes. You know, it was bad, and uh, and we got engaged. You know, and she was sponsored. God, by one of our wonderful speakers this week in Marilyn S. was Eileen's sponsor at the time. Thank God, Marilyn shepherded her when Eileen was so young in sobriety, and Marilyn knew that Eileen was estranged from her father. So she said to her, she goes, well, you must invite him to your nuptials. And so Eileen said, you don't understand. My father doesn't want anything to do with me. He won't communicate with me. He won't talk to me on the phone. I can only communicate with him through letters. And then he takes forever to respond. And the last time Eileen had written her father a letter is because she had a horrible health incident. And she had to go have a major surgery. And it was the kind of surgery, although the percentage is good, there's a small percentage that it could not be good. And it was very scary. And it was one of those surrenders I made in AA. I remember waiting for her to come out of surgery and the conversation I was having with God with a head full of what I wanted the outcome to be, but knowing that I couldn't pray for outcome and praying for knowledge of God's will and acceptance for whatever happened. And I remember when she wrote her father, just to let him know she was having this surgery. And he responded in writing, and it was very brief and very curt. He said, what do you expect after your kinky lifestyle? I don't think I like this guy very much. And she made it through the surgery fine, and there was a long recovery, and she recovered fine, and we're getting ready to get married, and Marilyn says you have to invite him. So she follows sponsor direction, and she invites her father to the wedding. And he writes back, I don't want to have anything to do with you or your new husband. I'm not coming. So he refused to give Eileen away at the wedding. Eileen goes to Marilyn, goes, I told you so. Marilyn says, well, invite him as a guest. Maybe he'd just like to attend. Uh. (laughs) She writes him again. He writes back, when I said no, I meant no. I want nothing to do with you. Broke my wife's heart. When you sit with a woman you love and somebody treats her that way and you watch her with her head in her hands and she's crying and she's a good member of Alcoholics Anonymous and she's trying so hard to make things right. I got a resentment. (laughs) And unity saves the day in that situation. What are we going to do? Who's going to give Eileen away? Marilyn gave Eileen away. We're sitting in a church with 350 people. And our minister is Aaron G. And Aaron G., we didn't know this because we just knew he was a minister. We asked him, will you marry us? And he said, of course I'll marry you. He never told us he had never married anyone before. (laughs) So I don't know who was more nervous on our wedding day, Eileen, me, or Aaron. And he's doing great. He's doing great with the ceremony. And at one point he loses his place in the book he's reading from. And it's dead quiet. And there's an uncomfortable silence that's going on way too long. And under my breath, I say, Aaron, read anything. (laughs) And he says, hey, man, there's funerals in here, too. And so (laughs) (laughs) and we got like six ushers and six bridesmaids. And then he asks the question, who gives this woman away? And Marilyn stands up, and everybody goes, ta-da, and points at Marilyn. And she goes, I do. And, uh, the, and you know, that happens in Alcoholics Anonymous where there's unity. And you have the fun, big days like that. But then there's the days where you just need to call somebody at 11 o'clock at night. And you know you got 25 people you can call, and you know they'll take the call. And you know they'll meet you for a cup of coffee if you need that, too. Because you're a part of something. And it's a symbiotic relationship. I'm dependent on them and they're dependent on me. You do funny things. You go on things called group moves. And you show up and 80 alcoholics show up at 845 on a Sunday morning. And they never told you who they were moving. And they never told you where you were starting from. And they never told you where you were ending up. Insanity. And the old man in his infinite wisdom, Clancy, said, alcoholics pick and choose who they help. You help them because they need to be helped and they're in the home group. And you would show up with 80 people at a group move and you'd move a two-story house in 45 minutes with a conga line. 
and the neighbors would come out in their bathrobes with cups of coffee to look at what was going on, and they'd go, who are you people? (laughs) And I remember many years later, after participating in many moves, in 1999, Eileen and I bought our first house, and 80 people showed up to help us move. And the neighbors came over for days afterwards wanting to know who I was. And I told them the truth. I'm just a guy with a lot of friends. Isn't that interesting when you come to Alcoholics Anonymous and nobody will take your phone call? And then you can say a statement like that. I'm just a guy with a lot of friends. And the third tradition is so important to me that the only requirement for AA membership is desire to stop drinking. And in the long form of that tradition, it says we can deny membership to none that suffer from alcoholism. And how important is that? Well, many of us wouldn't be here if there were requirements for membership. I think about the reasons that you would have wanted to exclude somebody like me my criminal record, my violent tendencies, my inability to follow direction, fall in with the crowd. I'm a distraction. I'm the guy that you know that's, that you know when I'm in the room. But the good thing about AA is we're not worried that you're going to hurt us, not one little bit. In fact, the worse you are, the more we like you. We know you're going to be fine because of the power that's in Alcoholics Anonymous, the love that's in Alcoholics Anonymous, and this inclusivity of the third Tradition is so important that we protect that. And is that just for our new friends that come to us that we don't know, or does that include people that have come to this way of life and have slipped? And I'm just saying, I've seen one alcoholic be harder on another alcoholic in this way of life than any group of people I've ever seen when somebody's had the audacity to drink again after a period of sobriety and show up in their home group. And it breaks my heart, and this is why. I would love to tell you something right-wing AA badass like I came to Alcoholics Anonymous September 16th, 1991, and I haven't found it necessary to take a drink, and that's accurate. But it excludes the five or six years where I woke up every day and it was in the room with me. That thought, not tonight, God, please not tonight, I'm dying, I can't do this one more time, yet I'm drunk every night. I know everything there is to know about slipping. I just didn't do it under the bright lights of AA. I can't imagine the kind of courage it takes to walk into Alcoholics Anonymous after that. Is that inclusivity of the third tradition in place when somebody leaves this way of life? Do I welcome them? Am I willing to let go of what I know about them, what I think they should have been doing? Or do I judge them and their level of seriousness and think to myself, I'm not going to invest the time or energy you're going to have to prove yourself to me, although I'll, as though I have my own membership rules. I think this inclusivity is so important in our home groups. I want to talk about the second tradition real quickly. It's one of these traditions that is so important in Alcoholics Anonymous, but it's become so important in so many areas of my life. There are principles contained within it that are so important. This idea that there's only one authority in Alcoholics Anonymous, a loving God, as he may express himself in our group conscience. This is more important to me today than it's ever been in my sobriety, and here's why. I know stuff. (laughs) Don't you? Boy, it is the death of teachability, knowing stuff in Alcoholics Anonymous having a lot of experience in AA. Because I love my home group. My current home group is the SOS Men's Group. We meet on Monday and Wednesday nights at St. James Church in the Fairhaven District of Bellingham at 7 o'clock. And I'll tell you what, I love that group. And I have had to learn that I am not the ultimate authority in that group. I have to wait. I'm like a vampire now. You have to invite me in. I'll sit outside the window of your consciousness. But I wait for the magic words that I don't hear enough in my home group. You know the magic words. Gee, Don, what do you think? Oh, doesn't it just make you just smile inside? And they rarely ask me. 
And I've had to learn to adopt an equilibrium, if you will, a sense of fair play about the conduct of my home group. What you allowed me to do in Alcoholics Anonymous, as you included me in your service structure, in your home groups, in your business meetings, in your committees, in your event planning, and all the wonderful things I've had an opportunity to participate in in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know what you've allowed me to do? Learn and make mistakes. You told me that making mistakes was part of the process here, not to worry about it. Am I willing to deprive the newer members of my group from making the mistakes if I'm outvoted? I had a very powerful experience about five years ago that changed my whole idea about the second tradition. We had a business meeting as we do every month, and some one of the newer guys in the group had a good idea, one of those good ideas that newer guys have that will never work. And, uh, and I do what I'm prone to do. I laid back and I let everybody discuss it. 15, 20 minutes. And then I, when, I, when all the discussion was pretty much done, I raised my hand. And then I released a well-prepared, well-thought-out, deep with experience counterpoint. And up to that point, the whole room was leaning in that direction. And in one fell swoop, I turned everybody in the other direction. And I had a sense of success and protection of my home group. Because I was trying to be of service and do the right thing for the group. And after the meeting, a guy with about three years asked if he could talk to me. I said, sure, and we're, we're good friends. We got along real well. I went out in the parking lot, and he goes, I hate when you do that. And I go, what do I do? And he told me exactly what I did. He said, you let everybody get all worked up, and everybody's going in one direction, and you know that that thing's going to pass. And then you come in with your big words and your fancy presentation, and you turn everybody the other way. Why can't you just let the group make decisions? And I was offended. I said something to the effect of, well, I'm sorry if your light isn't as bright as mine. But I'm not going to hide my light for anyone. And if we don't share our experience in Alcoholics Anonymous, what good is it? And that's how I left it with him that night. You know, there's a problem with prayer and meditation as a way of life. I don't direct a lot of my meditation. I just do it. And boy, did I get a message the next morning. So I made amends to that man, I made amends to that group, and I made a decision that I was going to watch which way the group was going. And unless I was sure it was going to destroy the fabric of my home group, I'd be willing to see what happened. It was five years ago. We're still there. We're doing better than ever. And I have been more hands-off in the last five years than I was in the previous ten years before that. There was a lesson in there for me about edging God out. I'll tell you the other thing. If God really is the ultimate authority as he expresses himself in our group conscience, I'll tell you something we do, and I throw this out as a suggestion, because I heard it from somebody else, and we've been doing it for 15 years probably. Any major change at our group, not a house cleaning thing, but any major change at our group that comes our way, or anything that comes down from the district or area or GSO or World Services, unless it's time sensitive, like we have to make a decision that night, what we do is we discuss it. We present all the facts and we have a discussion. And then we table it. And we table it under prayerful consideration. Because if I'm really trying to let God express himself through my conscience, and I have faith that everybody else in that meeting is trying to do the same thing, I'm going to have to give God room for that to happen. Because I don't know about you, but when I sit in my home group and there's a business meeting, and you present an idea to me, the first thing that hears it is my ego. I hear it with my intellect. And I think, is it right? Is it wrong? Will it work or is it a bad idea? Good idea. Where did they get up this? What's the background information? And I'm just into the intellectual side of it. I don't naturally think this. 
how would God have me feel about this? How would this serve the still-suffering alcoholic? What questions would I have if my life was on the line about this? See, that takes time. It takes time so I can pray and meditate. It takes time so I can talk to my spiritual advisor. I can talk to my sponsor. It takes time that I can take counsel with people. And there's people I take counsel with about certain things that happen. Some of them are in this room. They've received the phone calls from me. This is going on. What do you think? What do you see? This is what I see. I can't do that if I'm voting that night. So there's no emergencies in Alcoholics Anonymous. And if I really want to make sure God expresses himself in our group conscience, I have to allow time for that prayerful consideration. I want to talk about a little bit about controversy. I'm running short on time. I don't know any other way to put it. And I want to tell you, I want to be very clear about this. I'm just sharing my observation. I'm not taking anybody to task. I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad. But I will say this. I've never seen the 10th tradition take a beating like it's taken during the pandemic. And some people have talked about it. And some people have talked about going on to Zoom. And there's people talking about politics, and there's people talking about the pandemic, and there's people talking about civil unrest, and there's people talking about Black Lives Matter, and there's people talking... And I'll tell you what, there is stuff that's infiltrated Alcoholics Anonymous as though the 10th tradition doesn't start anymore. And let me tell you why that's so dangerous. I don't think it's going to hurt me. It doesn't hurt me any more than all the stuff you post on social media where I see the running gun battles between good AA members that are tearing somebody apart about a line in the big book. It doesn't hurt me. I just scroll past you and laugh at you. (laughs) Right? What about the new man or woman? What about people that know any better? What about the version of me who's walking into Alcoholics Anonymous and he's trying to figure out how he's not going to drink after the meeting? And he walks up and people are talking about their political affiliation and he thinks, I'm not like them, they can't help me. Or they're talking about their opinion on this or their opinion on that. You see, there's a problem with a guy like me. I forget what I was like when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I forget what's at stake here. And to quote my good friend Billy Ann, I heard him say it four years ago and knock my sock. It was the most simple thing in the world, one of the truest things I've ever heard in AA. He said, we're Alcoholics Anonymous. We're in the saving lives business. Phew, that should be a public service announcement. And I forget that. And why is that? What obscures me? Wonderful talk we had today on the second step. What obscures me? Pomp, circumstance, worship of other things. Well, I get a life here in Alcoholics Anonymous, don't I? I get a big, beautiful life. And I bring that life to Alcoholics Anonymous, and sometimes I forget how important AA is, and the only reason I have that big, beautiful life is because of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I show up to AA, and I got the world hanging all over me. I got my money problems, my sex problems, my marriage problems, my money successes, my sex successes, my marriage successes. I got my world hanging all over me, and I'm not ready to walk into Alcoholics Anonymous with all that stuff. See, that stuff shouldn't make it past the threshold of an AA meeting. What am I going to do about a thing like that? I'll tell you what I do. I shut off the truck, and I don't get out, ever, because I'm not ready to go to a meeting. And I just sit quietly. I say the same prayer, same variation of a prayer every time I go to AA. I say, God, I'm in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and i got the world and my problems hanging all over me. Let me leave all these problems in the front seat of this truck. I know you'll take good care of them. I know that it's just another night for me in Alcoholics Anonymous, and although I'm grateful for that, there could be somebody here tonight This is the most important night of their life. Give me eyes to see. Give me a heart to feel. Get me out of the way. And then I'll think quietly about what I was like when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. It only takes a couple of minutes. And now I can pull the keys out of the ignition, and I can walk into Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm a different guy. Because now I'm not walking in looking for a cup of coffee and my buddies to talk about my day. I'm looking for the new man to say hi to. I'm Don. I don't think we've met. Let me introduce you to some of my friends like you did for me. I'm ready to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. So Eileen and I got married. In 1999, we bought our first house. We got married in 96. 
by 99. We had paid off all our wreckage. I had paid off the IRS. She had paid off the student loans. And we, we did it by the numbers in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, we were married, living in a one-bedroom apartment on the west side with four cats on top of each other, you know, going to AA every night, having a very good time. And I remember we wanted to rent a bigger place, and our sponsor said, nope, save your money, pay off your wreckage, buy a house. Like, Damn it. And, uh, we took that direction, and one day we bought this house, man. And I got to tell you, man, I was, I was eight years sober at that time, and I was incredibly active in Alcoholics Anonymous, incredibly grateful for what had happened. But my ego is indestructible. <laughs> like an evil little monkey that just comes along for the ride. And when I think it's a, you know, it, this is what my ego does. It takes credit for everything good, and it deflects blame for everything bad. And when we got that house, I should have been grateful to Alcoholics Anonymous. I should have been grateful to God. I should have been grateful to strong sponsorship. And I was. But that evil part of me was like, my reward. You come to AA, you work the steps, you work with others, you become a good member, you pay back the money, you get a house. Where's that in the big book? It wasn't in the big book. It was right here in my head where my disease mainly resides. And 30 days later, I got to find out I was wrong. 30 days later, I get a call from Eileen, and Eileen got a call from Loma Linda University Hospital about an hour and a half from L.A. where her dad lived. And her dad had been sick, and we knew that, but we had no idea how bad he was sick. And he had taken a fall, and they had found him unresponsive, and they had taken him off to the hospital, and they had checked him out. And they found out he was riddled with cancer. He had it in every organ in his body. He had it in his lymph nodes. He had six or seven tumors in his head. And he was asking for Eileen. He's asking for the daughter who he wanted nothing to do with, the daughter he wouldn't give away at her wedding. And the daughter that I, in my opinion, he had treated so poorly. But we're in Alcoholics Anonymous, aren't we? And there's a principle we live by. It's called saying yes and being of service. So we got in the car and we drove to Loma Linda University and we sat in a room with a man that I barely knew. We'd only seen him once, I think. And uh, death was in the room and fear was in his eyes. And he looked at Eileen and he said, don't let me die here alone. Because it's a teaching hospital and they wanted to do a bunch of surgeries on him. They said, we're not going to save him, but we could learn some stuff. And we walked out in the hallway and we had a group conscience. And Eileen said, what are we going to do? I mean, we just moved into our house. And I instantly knew, yeah. 30 days ago, we'd have no place to bring him. The house I thought was about me, I guess it's not about me. And I said to my wife, I said, I don't know how we're going to do this, but I know this. We're in Alcoholics Anonymous. We have relationships with a power greater than ourselves that are the most important thing in our life. We have a tremendous home group that supports us. We'll figure it out. Let's bring him home. And we bring home this man, I'm filled with resentment. And we set up a hospital bed, and we get care during the day when we're working, and we trade off meetings at night, so one of us is always at home. And her dad had always been a difficult person, and I'll tell you what, dying from cancer didn't change that. <laughs> one night at 1.30 in the morning, I woke up because he's screaming at my wife, and I walk into the bedroom, and he's calling my wife every name in the book, and she runs out of the room, bursting into tears. And I got about an inch away from John's face, and I said, if you ever talk to my wife that way at the end, you won't have to wait for the cancer to kill you. Because I kind of felt I could take him at that point, you know. I just... <laughs> and he said, okay. And, uh... and I watched my wife be the greatest example of forgiveness and love I've ever witnessed personally in Alcoholics Anonymous. And what am I doing? I'm nursing the resentment I can't get rid of. But I'm not alone. I got the men and women of Alcoholics Anonymous with me. So when my wife goes to meetings at night and I'm watching John, this would happen. He'd sleep all day. He's on morphine. He's coming down to the end. It was almost like he'd hear the front door close and he'd go, da, and I'd go, son of a bitch. <laughs> And I go in and I take care of John all night. I can't get rid of the resentment. I feel like a spiritual phony. I call my sponsor, Robert C., in the Pacific Group, and I go, Robert, I feel so bad. The guy's dying in front of me, man. I got nothing. I got nothing on the inside for him. He goes, how are your actions? I go, they're clean. 
I mean, my actions are loving. My actions are kind. I'm doing everything I can for him. Why has this got to be so hard, Robert? He said, I don't know, Don. Maybe you'll figure it out somewhere in the process. A couple of nights later, I'm watching John, and he calls for me again, and I walk in, and somehow he had pulled himself into a sitting position on the bed, and I don't know how he did it because he had no strength left. We were carrying him to the toilet and back at this point, and he's patting the bed next to him, which means he wants me to sit next to him, and I'm thinking, oh, no, I don't want to sit down. And I'm thinking about you, and I'm thinking about Alcoholics Anonymous, and what do we do in AA? Well, we're loving, right? So I'll sit down next to him. That's a loving action, right? And he reaches over, and he grabs my thigh. And you've heard the expression death grip. I didn't. I never knew what that meant. I knew then. I didn't know he had the strength. I mean, he literally grabbed my thigh in terror. And he's breathing erratically, and it freaked me out. And now I'm really thinking about you, Alcoholics Anonymous, Alcoholics what do we do, what do we do, what do we do? And I throw my arm around him. That's a good loving act. I'm stiff as a board. John can't breathe. And I'm holding him, and I don't know what to do, and I'm thinking about you. And suddenly, all I can see is your faces. And this film runs by my eyes, in my mind, of all your kindness, all your gestures, all your patience, all your love. And you reach through that. And I dropped my hand down his back, and I stroked his back. And I stroked it again, and his breathing starts to settle down. And I'm stroking John's back, and his breathing completely levels out. And his head drops into my chest. And he curls into my body. And I'm holding John in my arms. And he falls asleep. And a few days later, On my wife's AA birthday, shortly after midnight when she came home from taking her cake, she was holding her father's hand when he left this world. And I called my sponsor after I had that experience with John because when I left the room that night when John fell asleep in my arms, whatever was wrong between us was gone and never to return. And I told my sponsor, I'm so glad I got to clear that up, what was wrong between me and John. And he goes, gosh, Don, he goes, sometimes you're so thick. You think that was your gift to John. He goes, that was John's gift to you. Every time I do service for you, it's always your gift to me. May I always do service. May I always live by these principles. And may I always receive the undeserved gifts that you continue to lay at my feet. I hope we stay sober forever. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.